Welcome to Season 4 of The Great Humbling. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a futurist, a poet, and a recovering sustainability consultant. In the spring of 2020, during the first lockdown, I began recording a series of conversations with Dougal Hine, co-founder of a school called Home. We started with a question. What if it makes sense to think of ourselves as living in a time of humbling, being laid low, brought down to earth. Pulling on that thread has taken us further and become more central to our work than either of us expected. So we're back now with an open-ended series as part of the wider patchwork of homewardbound.org. Thank you for listening. Skype has updated and it doesn't give me the thing where it's always on top uh, when I flip to other things. So I'm not going to be able to see you while I'm looking. Oh, and maybe I can tell you what, if I minimise the script window and, oh, and then it did pop up on top anyway. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Ed. Here we are, episode seven of our fourth slow motion series. <laughs> La- last time it was summer and we were sitting across a table and that was... I realised that the 30th episode, like looking back across these series. Um, so now we're back on Skype, but uh, I'm setting an intention for the the future. For episode 60, you have to come to Sweden and record with me here in the shoe shop. OK, well, let's make a commitment on that one. Yeah, it definitely feels rather different. Um, so in my rather chilly shed today uh, with the creep of autumn in the air although i did notice actually that the new sleeper train service to stockholm has started um from hamburg so i'll be keen to try that out because it's been a long time since i've been able to come um to sweden in any kind of manageable way by train so that sleeper might make it a little easier and you know i think we should just be comfortable with our own erraticism um, you know it's like it's a muse that runs wild and free it's not tied down to a schedule uh and you know if we can't enjoy it when we're doing it then uh, uh, we're doing something wrong so yeah I'm, I'm happy to be erratic we could rebrand the podcast as the erratic review <laughs> yeah exactly uh, it, when it comes it's the right oh, time okay enough of that so uh we i i don't know about you i had i had some lovely um messages back from people after the last episode um i had one from the artist lydia catterall who said she listened to it she said i was grinning all the way through you too the joy is palpable you're like schoolboys who think each other is really cool and are slowly working up to saying so it's gorgeous Uh, well that's that's a lovely thing to say lydia thank you very much yeah i think we'll know we've really made it when we do that you know, and a boyish masculine thing of just start taking the piss out of each other constantly, which reveals the deep love that sits beneath. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very nice to be able to like, come to your house and give you a hug um, after all of these long distance conversations. Oh, I know. It's just it's it's long overdue. I've had the same thing on the other podcast with John Richardson. I got to go and see him do his stand up comedy live in Norwich the other week. Um, and I realised I hadn't actually seen him in real life since 2019 <laughs> um since before we started recording the podcast and i still didn't get to see him that night because there was a fire alarm and the show was delayed which yeah. meant the pub had shut and anyway long story but yeah who needs who needs real life we do need real life because real life has hugs in it yeah definitely the campaign for real hugs well right, ed so our traditional question then what have, what have we been reading that's been making us think do you want to go first yeah so um Oh, there's a, there's a couple of things that have been really chiming with me. I've been trying to mix up my fiction and my non-fiction um, a bit more. Um, non-fiction, I, I've been reading Gaia Vince's new one, Nomad Century, which ties back um, to your friend, whose name is now going to elude me. Who's your friend who talks about migration? Oh, Felix Marquardt, the new nomads. So Gaia has sort of built on that, uh, I guess possibly taken inspiration from it. Um, and, and Felix's books is great. Uh, and what Gaia's done is sort of say, 
actually, if you want to sort of get through um, impending climate doom, what it's going to require is the biggest movement uh, and purposeful, conscious movement of people in history um, in order to take people out of uninhabitable parts of the world uh, and relocate them into habitable parts. I mean, it's and it's a gargantuan piece of work, but it's fascinating in terms of the very pragmatic, real politic um, that she articulates. And I, I'm finding it a, a very stirring read of potential. Um, and then I've mixed that up with Laleen Paul's The Bees, um, which is one of those extraordinary novels. I mean, it's it's entirely set within a hive um, with the central character, a sort of elevated sanitation worker bee um, who gets promoted to become a forager. Um, and it's just, it's really visceral in terms of the sort of implicit social commentary and the hierarchy of the hive and um, the the need for bees to obey and the punishment of death and retirement and sort of voluntary euthanasia. I mean, there's so many big themes uh, in the book, but all written from the wonderful perspective of a little fuzzy buzzing thing. Um, so I found that quite beautiful and, and, you know, one of those books that you end up reflecting on in quiet moments and going, wow, what, what does that mean? What would it be like to be a bee? And maybe we're bees. Maybe we are actually more like bees than we think. Wow. Okay. How to be a bee. How to uh, be a bee. I, so speaking of kind of um, cross species thinking and being and doing and writing, uh, I just finished The Nutmeg's Curse by Amitav Ghosh. I can't remember mm. if we, we, we might have talked about that before. I mean, we've definitely talked about Amitav's think, work. Yeah. I think we talked about Gun Island. We talked um, about Gun Island a while back, yeah. didn't we? But... Um, I mean, there's lots. So this is Ghosh's second nonfiction book about climate uh, following on from the Great Derangement. And it's also like the strand that came to the fore in it for me is he's talking about vitalism, about the sort of the countercurrent within the history of Western thought that takes life seriously. Mm. that doesn't regard the world as made up of dead stuff to be manipulated by us and as ultimately meaningless and just a game of accumulation and resource exploitation. And he's obviously, you know, he's connecting that to both pre-modern European worldviews and the experience of indigenous peoples and many other cultures and it's just, it's really interesting how many different places that story is coming together mm. from now. That feels like something that might be worth us like returning to and kind of zooming in on a, a future episode. I guess to mention one more book from all the stuff that I've read in recent months um, that also is a, a, you know, in a different genre, but um, a really powerful piece of kind of trans species storytelling. Sarah Thomas's memoir, Raven's Nest, which is this haunting story of her, her experience of finding herself making and then ultimately losing a home in Iceland. And the journey, and it's partly a human story, but part of what's remarkable about it as a book is the way that the land and the other creatures are on a, a kind of equal footing with mm. the human story of the relationship between her and the Icelandic man who who she marries and the the journey of their relationship. Um, so yeah, if you want something to read for the kind of darkening evenings that will really mm. take you through what it's like to live a long way up at the north end of the planet and fall in love with a place and a person and then deal with like, the consequences of that on the ground. I, I highly, highly recommend Sarah's book. Mm, sounds lovely. Sounds beautiful. Well, so one or two things have happened like, <laughs> since we met in July. I have a feeling, I can't remember all of them right now, but what's been going on, Ed? Well... I don't know. This is a trouble. You go off air, and then um, the world sort of seems to unravel um, ever faster. 
Um, I don't know. I've been reflecting on the sort of managed descent of Conservative Prime Ministers in the UK. So, <laughs> you know, you've got Cameron, um, which apparently means crooked nose. Um, if you go back to the Scottish <laughs> roots. And, and then you had May with the sort of literally living the prevarication of, you know, will she, won't she? Um, we got relentlessly penetrated by Johnson and now we've got trust. Um, you know, we're all trussed up. We're all trussed up, literally, you know, to have your arms tied to your sides or to truss up the wings and legs of a game bird uh, before you insert the sta- sage and onion. So it's like, it's it's pretty it's pretty grim here. And then obviously the financial meltdown of Kamikaze's mini budget. Um, so politically, it's a pretty unpleasant um, scene right now. Um, I don't know. And then you listen to the sort of nuclear sabre rattling in Ukraine. And um, I've actually got uh, uh, a couple of Ukrainians um, through the refugee programme coming to live here um, for six months. So I've been sort of much more intimately connected into to that um, trauma now. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to hosting them, but also fully aware of the fact that you know, it's not going to be easy for them. If it's hard for us to watch this from a distance, it must be even harder um, if it's your home uh, rather than just trying to empathise um, with the grim experiences. And I don't know, it, it comes back to this sort of sense of, you know, the long emergency, which I which I talk about a lot um, with my fellow future, or, you know, this sort of perma crisis or what they called omni shambles um, in the in in the thick of it, where there's all these sort of creaking institutions beginning to sort of uh, fall apart. Um, and then on, on on top of all that, you know, we've got the the death of a never to be repeated seven decade monarch. So it's it genuinely feels like the end of an age and the end of an Elizabethan age. I can't remember the last time that something happened that caused such mutual incomprehension among people I'm mm. connected to as this royal death and succession. And it's not even it's not like Brexit. It doesn't play out in this kind of angry antagonistic way it's just a genuine gulf Mm. between how some of the people i was talking to and others who like people who would be in dialogue about lots of things and you know belong to some of the same circles but just experienced everything that happened in the wake of the queen's death utterly differently Mm. and you know some of them like some people expressing this experience of it as sort of deeply and strangely meaningful often a sense Mm. of being surprised Mm. at themselves by their reactions and then there are other people I've spoken to who who just seemed to be kind of horrified and alienated by the reactions that they saw going on around them yeah I, I, I totally connect to that false binary I mean I think it's probably um safe to say that we know our respective positions in regard to the monarchy but what i found uncomfortable is that you were either a grief-stricken subject you know in a sort of hat doffing deferential monarchist type of fashion or or a callous tradition stomping republican with an appalling sense of timing for voicing your beliefs and there didn't seem to be much space in between for those of us you know who who were neither perhaps avowed Republicans nor avowed monarchists, but did find the ritual and the transition and the notion of some kind of collective grief of passing of something. And whether that was just a monarch or many people have articulated the sense of loss that people weren't able to share perhaps during the pandemic. And there was a lot of low level trauma bubbling up from that, um, um, marking the ones who passed during that period. And I don't know, I, I, I kept going back to Ursula Le Guin, you know, when she talked about um, when people question the inevitability of capitalism and, and I'll paraphrase slightly, but, you know, she sort of said, well, yes, we also believed in the divine right of kings, um, which is true. And that and that obviously passed, although, you know, in a hereditary monarchy, what I did find intriguing was this you know, the notion that the monarchy is now born to serve, (laughs) which is obviously a bit of a rebrand and a reposition um, to the deeper historical roots. Um, And I couldn't help feeling we were being ever so slightly gaslit during that. Um, And then one thing that did make me laugh, though, was uh, President Macron of France's tribute to the Queen, which was great um, in the light of what the French did to their royal family. 
So, <laughs> yeah, now you mention it, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So we often talk about the divine right of kings as if that is the kind of... Um, the primitive earliest version of monarchy and then it's been kind of modernized away from that and as you say you know there is a certain kind of narrative around service now which would not have been how anyone two or three hundred years ago thought of um the monarchy in a country like the uk i don't think um I also want to push back against that slightly because the divine right of kings as a concept was actually, and this is this is me remembering Tony Nuttall, my old tutor at Oxford, pointing this out <laughs> to us. The divine right of kings isn't some timeless thing that's kind of been around from the year dot. It was actually articulated in the early modern period. Mm. It was a kind of strengthening, like, you know, the opposite of humbling, I guess, ar- arrogantizing account of what kingship was yeah um i mean there are in the roots of kingship there are even kind of pre-hereditary elective um approaches to monarchy certainly sweden has some of that in its kind of pre-modern history but also if you really want to talk about service i mean i remember rowan williams before he was Archbishop of Canterbury and presumably became a little bit more reserved in expressing opinions on things like this. But I remember him saying, mm, maybe maybe where things went wrong with the monarchy was when the Maundy Thursday service stopped involving the king or queen actually washing the feet of the poor. That used to be mm. what that ritual was. Mm. And it became sanitised into this giving of this special bag of Maundy money, the special coins. So somewhere, like, the the roots are more tangled, I guess is what I want to say. Mm. And, I mean, it's very it's very typical of this podcast that you say, let's try and find a way beyond the kind of binary mm. of those immediate reactions. Um, and maybe it's our sort of trickster tendency to try, <laughs> it. as you say, like, the, the connection between the artist and the trickster is, like, you know, the artist is the person who, if you give them a binary choice, will find a third option. They'll make the coin <laughs> land on its side. They can stay longer with ambiguity and ambivalence without getting uncomfortable than you know, people occupying other roles within a society. And this is why Lewis Hyde's articulation of the artist as a kind of manifestation of trickster energy in modernity mm. is spot on. But we want answers, Dougal. Well, we want answers. <laughs> okay, if, no, if no, you want... I if I'm you want that. if you want answers, then uh, listen to Pat McCabe, Woman yeah. Stands Shining, this amazing Dine Elder. I, I actually I listened to a bunch of um, conversations and talks by her on YouTube the other day while I was um, laying flooring in the shoe shop. Um, but the thing that brought me back to her work recently was that there was this extraordinary Facebook post that she wrote very soon after the news of the Queen's death which really opened up this other sort of space of how we might be thinking about all of this. So I'm just going to read you a bit of this. She said Mm. she was talking about like the reaction. She was in some kind of Zoom event with a bunch of, you know, probably kind of activist people, you know, I don't know, probably some other indigenous people in the group, whatever, when the news came through. And she said various people spoke about like being surprised at their reaction to hearing the news. And this is what she wrote. She said, It made me remember when I was in Spain, in the same room with the crypt of King Ferdinand of Spain. A strange, horrifying fascination filled me to sit with those bones, with my son and a dear sister. She said, Let's pray. And as we prayed, I heard her finally say, I forgive you. I felt a shock run through my body. My son leaned over to whisper to me, I can pray for him, Mom, but I can't forgive him. I could only respond, that's okay, son, just pray. So I prayed for quite a long time, and eventually I found myself being able to come around also to say, I forgive you. What happened next was beyond anything I could imagine. The spirit of King Ferdinand came to me, and in a desperate, pleading whisper, he asked me, tell me, Tell me, please, what can I do now? Please tell me. 
I could feel his pain. I could feel his raw consternation. I could feel his trembling willingness. I told him that I could not answer that, but I knew where he could go to have that question answered. I told him that I would be going to ceremony in a few months and that I would call for him to come and I would take him to the tree. There he could ask and all of his questions would be answered by one who knows. And if you read the rest, we'll stick the link in the show notes. If you read the rest of that post, there's more. And, you know, all of this is just utterly beyond the pale of Western modernity, of like mm. what you're meant to take seriously if you want to be taken seriously as a high status white man in a scientific materialist society. And I want to say, like, there's a, you know, when I've heard the Republican or kind of um, left wing kind of critiques of everything that went on around the Queen's death, I have felt a lack or like a tone deafness within that, which is not exactly comfortable for me to say, but reading Pat's piece helped me say, look, there might be, you know, for those of us who like maybe haven't been directly affected in the way that Pat's Mm. family and people have been by the history of colonialism, but for whom it's very strongly in our consciousness and our thinking to nonetheless be able to say there might be other stranger things going on. You know, there might be more in heaven and earth than is allowed for in our philosophy, Horatio, as Hamlet (laughs) says. Somehow that piece was what broke it open for me and helped me find a way beyond the backwards and forwards uh, stories that I saw in Mm. circulation in those days after the Queen's death. Mm. And there's also, there's something really powerful of the intergenerational aspect of, you know, Pat with her son and a dear sister and this long deceased King. Um, And I don't know. I mean, I watched the funeral. I watched some of the funeral with my five-year-old daughter. um, And it's always intriguing to listen to the curious questions that emerge from uh, a young head, but, you know, I mean, I was, I was moved to tears by the bagpipers, but it's only because I find the bagpipe incredibly stirring on some very deep and resonant level. Um, but then my daughter sort of pipes up. And she goes, "Daddy, is the Queen in that box?" And I was like, uh, "Yes, yes, she's in there." Yeah, like, are we going to see her? And I was like, no, "Well, no, no, I hope not." Um, which ends her head. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's under the flowers. Um, you know, and then and then having to try to explain bearskins, you know, on the on the heads of the of the the troops parading and and getting incredibly tangled up and actually incorrectly telling her that they were no longer real bearskins, which apparently they still are. Um, I would have thought we would have found, apart from the kind of inevitable impracticality of wearing two feet of of, of bear on your head. Um, not exactly uh, equipped for for military manoeuvres. But I would have thought they would have come up with some synthetic alternative by now, but apparently not. Oh, well, I mean, uh, it just depends whose perspective you're looking from. Because here in Sweden, I I, I was thinking about this because we we were at a wedding right at the end of August and we were staying in this little village in the north of Dalarna and um, there was kind of, there was, gunfire in the hills around and one of the locals said to us yeah yeah there uh there's a bear hunt mm. going on uh and not not the michael rosen i can say we're hunt. going on a bear hunt we're not gonna, that kind go, of bear hunt we can't go around it we can't go over it we're gonna have to go through it and then shoot it so from the from the human perspective the bear population is getting a bit big the bears might have their own opinion on the human population <laughs> But my uh, my mother-in-law, who is Finnish, um, tells me that bear is very tasty and there is a restaurant you can go to. She insists, so there's a restaurant you can go to in Helsinki. She insists that they serve bear that has come from Russia. I don't know whether this is true or not, but I can definitely, like, knowing Finnish culture a bit, I can see that as a, as a restaurant concept in Helsinki, come and eat the Russian bear is probably a winning concept. <laughs> Here we are in the world of anthropocentric geopolitical cuisine. Oh, wow. Yeah, but aren't, but, but aren't you aren't you a silver jubilee, baby Dougal? Aren't you a little bit? You're a little bit younger than me. I, aren't you? 
I am. I was born in 1977, the year of God Save the Queen. And uh, I was not, not just a Silver Jubilee baby. According to the BBC, no less, I, I will have you know, I was a Silver Jubilee babe. Babe. In, yeah, in the Golden Jubilee year, they did a whole load of programming around like the significance of 50 years of the Elizabethan era or whatever. And they had a kind of, they had a public debate with all of these kind of prominent figures um, on BBC One one night. But then they had, you know that, do you remember the era of press the red button in your mm. digital box and yeah. you get like an extra feature? So I was part of the extra feature because they had three of us and they did an online thing and we went to Oxford and all spoke at the Oxford Union, which I had like never been to in my three years as a student there. And <laughs> uh, so we were all 25. We'd all been born in the Silver Jubilee year. And there were these two young women, one of whom was a kind of very serious and compassionate Republican the other was, you know, quite a staunch monarchist. And I was kind of, well, I was the trickster in the middle. I was the one going, well, I'm like, I, I think it's in the immortal words of Facebook, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and I, you can probably still find a video somewhere in the depths of the BBC site of me kind of riffing on this at the at the Oxford Union. But yeah, so I, I suspect the only time in my life that I've been referred to as a babe <laughs> um, but maybe I can like maybe I can take that out of context and put it as a quote on my book cover. I don't think yeah. that's going to work very so well. So you didn't you didn't get to meet the Queen as a Silver Jubilee babe. Uh, the, so the the closest I ever came to meeting the Queen was when I was an undergraduate at Oxford. I came I was late for a job interview. I came running out of the gates of my college, running along the street, and I'm like, oh, the street's very empty. Oh. Why is there a like a police motorcycle at the other end of the street? Why is there a strange vehicle, like some kind of hearse, where it's like the kind of double decker car, where you can see the people in the back seat over the head of the driver? That old woman looks terribly familiar. That man's looking a bit cross. And I sort of swerve off. I've been running down the middle of New College Lane. I swerve onto the pavement. I, oh yeah. That was the Queen. So, uh, so lucky, yeah, lucky I wasn't. Over, yeah, you nearly got run over by the Queen. Can you imagine the scandal of that? Yeah, Silver ow. Jubilee babe roll, <laughs> run, run over by royal motorcade. There we go. That was that was one of the many near misses of my life. So how about yeah. you? Do you ever run into the Queen? Uh, well, not dissimilar. I mean, it was basically a glimpse uh, in a passing motorcade. But I remember uh, the Queen was on some visit to Norwich and... Uh, being the cathedral school, the school had sort of lined us all up um, on the pavement and there were various benches and, and, and street furniture that people were hanging off um, in order to get a better view. And I remember, I'm not going to name him um, because that would be uh, <laughs> possibly libelous, um, but there was a boy from the senior year um, standing on the bench behind me who, in a moment of uh, total lack of deference, uh, proceeded to wave um, his willy um, at the passing motorcade and I, and I remember my old art teacher who shall also remain nameless um, he sadly died last year but he just turned around and said put it away x <laughs> did, did, didn't castigate him and, and just just said put it away that's not really appropriate which I just thought was I, I thought at the time it was brilliant um, and maybe my art teacher you know, had a little thread of republicanism in him but well, it's yeah. a nice, nice, nice example of how to carry authority. Like you don't need yeah. to, you know, uh, you don't need to rant and rage or anything. You no. just, you know, just the firm word. Withering. Yeah. Withering, withering heights, withering depths. So, but I mean, Ed, look, um, you've been deeply involved in the British environmental movement in like slightly more respectable capacity than me. That You must have crossed <laughs> paths with... Charles the Third at some point over the years. Yeah, no, I've been to I've been to several drinks receptions at Clarence House and those kind of things for the sort of great and good um, of of the environmental movement um, for my sins. Um, and I yeah, I don't know. I mean, 
I, I, I think his heart's in the right place. I mean, there's, again, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, I mean, and certainly his sort of pioneering of, of many issues around organic agriculture and um, the things he did with the, the Duchy of Cornwall um, are, are impressive. I mean, they're not very inclusive, though. I guess that's the thing. It's always done in this sort of slightly... Um, a superior like if only everyone could see the world the way i do kind of way um but i mean i guess there are some hopes that he will be um a green king or the green king um which always makes me feel a bit thirsty uh but that's that's probably a beer related uh, obsession um although you know let's face it we're not off to an auspicious start with the prime minister telling him he's not welcome at at, at cop so um at cop 27 so i don't know uh it has potential, and clearly, the the monarchy could do some very uh, influential and transformative things if it decided to engage in a radical ecological transformation. Let's not hold our breaths, but um, equally, let's not dismiss um, its role in, in, in change. So, I mean, going back to that thing I was talking about before, that the sense of lack that I had in many of the kind of reasonable, sceptical accounts of like, why we shouldn't be taken in by this staged uh, PR operation of um, the kind of invented rituals of monarchy and, and so on. I, a piece that kind of connects to that and we'll maybe take us through to some of the other things that have been going on since we last sat down to record was um, a Substack post from my uh, old pal Paul Kingsnorth, The Nation and the Grid. And I mean, Paul's written a lot about Englishness over the years. And I, I, the first time he and I ever met in person was at the launch of his book, Real England, The Battle Against mm. the Bland, which mm. I think was a wonderful book. And, you know, I've seen him take a lot of flack over the years, often undeserved for trying to ask thoughtful questions about people's relationship to their sense of belonging mm. um, at the level of Englishness. Um, but I was really struck by you know, just something that at its best is happening with the way that people are using Substack, which is that the conversations that they're getting into and the kind of thoughtful, reflective nature of that space at its best, if you compare it to, uh, let's say, Twitter, which we've talked about plenty <laughs> in earlier series, it, it leads people further in their thinking. And I really felt that reading this piece. And there was one paragraph in particular where, you know, Paul's articulated some of his feelings about uh, the nation versus the grid, which is this kind of dystopian vision that he kind of had one day whilst working on um, on Real England, and which is kind of what he often writes about in terms of the machine. And I, you know, I, I feel a lot of affinity with what he's articulating in a lot of that writing. But there's this bit where he's, he's sort of, you know, he does what other writers wouldn't do and pulls back from just rolling on with the rhetoric mm. of mm. the bit that speaks to him in nationhood. And he says it would be easy enough to portray the current war over nationhood, as many do, as some David versus Goliath struggle between plucky little nations and dastardly globalists intent on their demise. To me, it looks more like a situation in which nobody is clear quite what they want or how to get it. Proponents of corporate globalism want a borderless, frictionless world that offers minimal barriers to trade and movement. Nationalists want prosperous nations without the cheap immigration that fuels prosperity. Liberals want multiculturalism and social cohesion, despite the persistent evidence that one undermines the other. The left wants a world without borders that somehow also contains welfare states. And the right wants to defend the traditional ethnic makeup of nations without acknowledging that ethnicity is increasingly meaningless in a globalised world. And it's like, I might not put all of those statements in exactly the same way, mm. but as a, as a description of the mess we're in that acknowledges the flawedness of all of the positions being articulated today, I think it gets mm. us closer 
to a to the heart of the mess we're in and therefore to the starting point from where we might be able to have a conversation about what's really worth doing mm. yeah i mean it I think Paul articulates the contradictions very well, doesn't he, and the inconsistencies. Uh, okay, thinking of Alice in Wonderland, you know, the ability to believe six impossible things before breakfast, hmm. um, the Queen of Hearts, I think, said that. But um, it also reminds me of the old Ben Elton joke when Guinness, back in the day, launched an ill-fated lager brand called Enigma. Um, and I can imagine Ben Elton describing... Paul King's North buying a round in the pub because I have a pint of Enigma, a half of Paradox and a small conundrum, no ice, please. I can't really imagine Paul ever buying a pint a of lager. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can definitely imagine Paul buying a round. A pint of lager is harder to imagine. He, he's he's yeah. definitely a real ale man. Yeah, but, but, you, but you just had an election in Sweden, didn't you, That's uh, that's been in the news a little bit? Oh, yeah. Thank you for bringing me on to that cheery subject. Yeah. Um, well, I mean... Um, yes. So we had a general election and it's been a, a kind of long, there's been a, a sort of long boiling um, mess, really, of Swedish politics, at the heart of which lies the rise of this party, the Sweden Democrats, who mm. occupy a similar position within the political landscape to, you know, all sorts of parties that we might call um, you know, populist, um, na- national populist parties, let's say, in Europe. And what's interesting is those parties have often come from slightly different political routes. Like some of them have started as more kind of technocratic uh, EU critical parties like UKIP when it was started by a bunch of professors or you know, alternative for Deutschland started like that. Some of them have come, you know, actually from libertarian or left-ish populist places and then pulled rightwards. I think there's one in Finland that had that sort of story. Um, mm. Don't don't quote me on that. Um, what's distinctive about the Sweden Democrats is that their origins are so deeply connected to, you know the far right white supremacism mm. neo nazi movements like it's really dark when you look at the scene out of which this party was founded and then it's been on this journey and i mean its current leader would tell you and i'm sure many of its voters would that it's left all of that behind a long time ago um and certainly it's come to occupy a similar function to parties that have come from other places within the landscape of um, this particular European democracy. On the other hand, you had on election night when it had gone rather well for them and they'd come in second place and were the largest party on the right-hand side of the, the kind of strange block system that we have in the Scandinavian democracies. There was a candidate who was clearly very um, uh, lubricated and there's a, there's a clip of her being interviewed. Like, firstly, she tries to pour her glass of champagne down the journalist's mouth. And, and he says, I'm working. And then uh, and then she shouts this weird thing. Uh, like, Hell ye which is, I, I mean, it kind of means weekend victory. Uh, and Sierga Hell, uh, a victory weekend is something like you might read in an account of like a sports team that had a really good win on Saturday. But no one says Hell Sierga, except that it sounds very similar to the Swedish version of Sieg Heil. Um, and so just in case uh, anyone had had the bad taste washed out of their mouth by the, the journey that the Sweden Democrats had gone on over the years, then you've got that. So... Um, like nothing to feel cheery about if you're not cheered by the prospect of uh, parties that still flirt with um, like their Nazi past having a significant role in the politics of the country that you live in. Um, the way that governments are formed here means that just because they're the biggest party on the right hand side of the political spectrum doesn't mean that they get to form a government or be in government um, because whoever whichever party forms the government requires support to its right and to its left um and so you've got the the equivalent of the conservative party 
in the process of trying to form a government which will be dependent to one side on the Liberals and to the other side um, on uh, the Sweden Democrats. But it, obviously it puts them in a powerful position. It reflects a very large proportion of people in this country having voted for this mm. party. Um, and I mean, there's all sorts of things we could mm. say about that. And I that's guess, a hard bit to escape from, isn't it? In, in that sense, it was obviously it's a significant chunk of the vote, and there's a representation there. That's, yeah. Uh, and, and what what's your analysis on on what's been happening there? Then that this vote has continued to grow. Well, I mean, look, it's it's not so different to what we've seen in lots of Western democracies, which is that there is an increasing gap between, you know, people who are aboard the train of this latest phase of modernity and people who, you know, not always, are not always kind of economically the most uh, excluded, although some of them you know, might be in kind of quite precarious um, conditions, but who feel like they're on the outside. Um, they're looked down on by the big city people. Like there's a, a strong vote in rural areas and living in a small town in rural Sweden, I understand like some of where that is coming from, the sense that none of the established parties really care about mm. the people who were kind of seen as a bit backward and like, why why don't they just move to the city and get into the 21st century? And like, there's some really, it's, it's like the one socially acceptable form of prejudice in modern Western societies is against small town people and rural people. And that's mm. part of what is mobilised by a party like this. But I guess I'm not trying to speak in their defense but what i would want to say is like okay their their vote has literally grown eight general elections in a row and i don't know if there are i i don't know if there are many other parties in western democracies that can point to such a you know, successive story mm. of growth and at that point if you are you know if you're not comfortable with parties with these kinds of political roots exercising a significant role within your parliament and your political system, then do you just keep repeating the same messages mm. that you have done eight times in a row that haven't stopped this growing? Or could there be some need, uh, some need to try and work out what's lacking, what's been yeah. missing from what's been being said by the people we might feel more... Um, affinity with uh what is it you know what if the things that are being spoken to by these parties that we don't like and wouldn't want to be associated with are not all just horrible evil toxic things what if yeah. they are putting their fingers on some things and maybe like drawing drawing conclusions that are different to the ones we would see as worth drawing but that really need to be spoken about, really need to be taken seriously and aren't being by, you know, um, other parts of the political spectrum. And I guess one place I go with this is I'm thinking about Bruno Latour, yeah. who just died. Uh, may he rest in peace. Um, a fascinating philosopher of science. And one of his later books was called, in English, it was called Down to Earth. The original title in French translates as Where to Land. And that's a kind of reference to this, the, the most powerful image he has in that book, which is he says, it's like this. We're, we're passengers on a plane that took off and was headed to this destination called the global, called progress, called the future. And the, the, you know, the pilot comes on the um, loudspeaker and says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're no longer able to land at that destination. We're going to have to turn back. And then uh, a few minutes later, the dreaded message comes. Uh, I'm afraid we're not able to land at the airport that we set off from either. And Latour says, this is kind of our situation politically now. Like all the versions of progress were oriented towards this trajectory of the global, whether it was a kind of left liberal version mm. in terms of um, human rights and 
um, you know, a progressive story of the universal or whether it was a right economic liberal version of globalization and capitalism and the end of history like all of those promises which were owned by different sides of the political spectrum are failing and he writes in that book he's framing it explicitly in relation to climate change as the thing that is making these promises evaporate and nor can we go back to the place which is nostalgically invoked often by mm. the kind of the right wing populist nationalist um, forces that are gaining kind of energy out of that sense of the failure of the future. His answer is, you know, where do we go? We have to kind of we have to be brought down to earth. And as Bayo yeah. Kamalafe says, you know, we're coming down to earth. We will not arrive intact. We're going to be broken yeah. by this. And I see that as inviting us to something messier and more complex than just doubling down on our sense of who's on the right side of the argument within the existing map of yeah. the political spectrum. And that's where, you know, like that passage I quoted from Paul's Substack post, to me, begins to speak to what it's like when we really accept Latour's invitation to be brought down to earth. In essence, it's the difference between uncertainty and certainty, isn't it? It's like what some of the the values and the the desires that that that, that the right is tapping into, not just in Sweden but in Italy and and elsewhere as well, it is to bring in you know those those senses of belonging and strength and power, and um, and that offers you know a, a, a certainty that fascism specialises in, um, whereas. The alternative is actually to be able to embrace some of the uncertainty. Um, and I think, I don't know, for me, I, I spoke at an event, and I guess this is maybe an interesting point to finish on, because when you see all of that turmoil, I, I chaired an event in, in Barcelona recently called Fixing the Future. Um, you, you know, and I stood up to open the event and I said, I don't think this is about fixing the future in that mending and repairing sense um in actual fact you know i think a lot of that solutionizing uh is actually part of the problem you know it's it flies directly in the face of what latour is saying actually you know where do we land as we are broken and some of those solutions just perpetuate um the the deeper problems and instead i reframed the event i said let's think about it as fixing the range of possible futures with an unswerving gaze to fix our eyes on those possibilities that are laid out in front of us because we need to move beyond that that notion of perceiving things as as problems uh, and actually to understand that this is a predicament with with no easy answers maybe if we are looking for ways to approach that predicament then Looking for what is lacking. Looking for, you know, it's something that, again, I mean, we often come back to her work, but Vanessa Andriotti and others in the, the Decolonial Futures Collective, I've heard them talk about not even trying to bring in the thing that is lacking, but trying to visibilize the lack mm. first because it tells us something about the space in which the conversation is taking place. It's like we can't necessarily bring the thing that is lacking into this space as it exists. We need to rethink the kind of space in which our conversations are taking place and you know, work out what it would look like to have a space of political conversation that had room for the different kinds of trauma that are present, the kinds of lack, the sense of unravelling, the sense of... I, I think sooner or later this is going to bring us to the terrain of whatever we call it, the metaphysical, the spiritual, or just you know, the domain of, of meaning. Mm. And you know, if we can't get there recognising that this has often been lacking from the forces politically that thought of themselves as being you know on the right side of history you know when presented with some of the the kind of darker political elements that we're talking about if we can't recognize that that's often been lacking on this side then we end up ceding the ground 
of that stuff to people we would not want to see power going to. And it feels like those are the kind of conversations maybe that we're trying to trying to find a way to invite people into. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. If you'd like to follow the threads in our conversations further, head over to homewardbound.org. We will also find my substack, Writing Home. You'll find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Frucool on Twitter. We're always glad to hear from those of you who are listening, and we're deeply grateful for all that our listeners do to spread the word and bring these conversations to new ears by sharing the podcast along your networks and giving it ratings or reviews on the platforms where you listen. These are strange and humbling times, and we need quiet corners, breathing spaces, air pockets and pockets of resistance, places in which to puzzle through how we got here and where we might be going. Thank you for helping us create one of those pockets. <laughs>